Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jeff. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about writing uh, deep Postgres extensions, real Postgres extensions that do interesting stuff uh, beyond just maybe a UDF, something like that, in a language called Rust. Uh, probably a lot of the people in here have heard about the language Rust. Um, uh, is there anybody in here that hasn't heard of, of Rust or don't really know anything about it? Um, okay. So uh, I'll kind of briefly go over that. Um, uh, I won't be talking as much about the language itself. The code samples should be uh, legible um, to, you know, uh, for the most part they're not, um, except for the last one, but that's for a different reason. I'll get into that. Um, so uh, let me just talk about the motivation here. So uh, Postgres is more and more reliant on the ecosystem of extensions. There are important extensions out there that do uh, important things for a lot, of, uh, a lot of Postgres users and customers. And uh, that's a good thing. You know, uh, having an extensible database system provides a lot of flexibility in terms of things like uh, you know, not needing to wait for uh, release cycles of the main Postgres product, not needing to uh, you know, uh, meet some of the, the standards you know, in terms of maybe you depend on libraries that might have an unacceptable license for the Postgres project, um, or maybe you're using proprietary code or something like that. And for those reasons, maybe it can't make it into the main Postgres SQL code base. And it, it shouldn't. Um, and it's great that we have the flexibility to use those uh, maybe a proprietary library or a, a GPL library or something that would never be accepted into the main code base, but still provides really important functionality. PostGIS is a good example of that. Very important, uh, you know, spatial library, uh, spatial extension for Postgres. And um, but you know, it depends on libraries that have different licenses. PostGIS itself has a different license. So anyway, this is this is all good stuff. Um, and uh, you know, I'd like to expand this uh, beyond C. I'd like to expand this capability of writing extensions to a new set of developers uh, that, for whatever reason, may uh, not be able to or not want to use C as a programming language. Um, and you know, Rust is offering another option. Right now, everything needs to be C. So this, you know, going from you know supporting one language to supporting two, that's you know, hopefully, you know, that's a big step. It's, uh, there aren't really many options um, out there uh, aside from C, and I'd like to create a second one. Uh, so why Rust? Uh, you know, there's a lot of marketing out there. This isn't an advocacy talk about Rust, uh, but it's got some nice features. It's got a nice community. Uh, it provides some, uh, Im you know, improved uh, memory safety features, you know, above what C can offer. Uh, it's, you know, uses a modern type system that helps catch a lot of errors. Um, uh, uh, but it's also nice and low level. It's suitable for, uh, you know, at least um, ostensibly suitable for low level work. Um, so it's not kind of adding code, uh, you know, behind your back. It's not got, you know, large runtime or uh, injecting extra fields into structs or things like that. Uh, it really just, you know, allows you to work with the memory representation that you already have or really want to use, and then you can use the other language features on top of that representation. It doesn't impose a lot of that on you, um, it, and it doesn't kind of inject code or use, uh, you know, um, use aspects of the runtime that might conflict with what Postgres wants to do. Uh, so, you know, Rust, if we're going to support a second language, we, we really have very few options that actually meet these requirements. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, there's, you know, C, you know, and then after that, the options, you know, get a little bit thin. C++, Rust, you know, might be a couple of obvious ones. Um, I think Rust, you know, is different enough. It's kind of a more interesting exercise and might open us up a little bit more to a wider group of developers than uh, trying to say work with C++. Uh, it's also, you know, got a, an awesome ecosystem and an awesome community, and I'd like to, you know, kind of bring all those people into, you know, the idea that, hey, you can write a really interesting extension that really expands the functionality of Postgres in interesting ways uh, in their language of choice. Uh, right now, 
uh, the Postgres world is C. I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. There are some really nice uh, PLs out there, and I've, I've used those to great effect. They're really convenient to use, uh, but they're fairly constrained um, in that it's you know, pretty much scalar functions, set returning functions. You can do a few things like that. Um, there might be some efficiency costs going in and out of that. Uh, and, you know, but I mean, really, if you want to do things like this, foreign data wrappers, custom data types, uh, index support functions, uh, background workers, UDFs, you know, calling lots of internal functions all over the place um, uh, that might be, you know, not really intended to be called from a UDF, then, you know, you need to use C, right? That's the current state of the world. And I'm, I'm trying to change that so you can do all of these things. Uh, with an additional language. So what about procedural languages? I, I mentioned this briefly before, but you know, procedural language, the infrastructure here is great. You have the ability to write, you know, say, in Perl or Python or JavaScript uh, or PLPG SQL, you have this ability to write functions and even you know, execute queries using the server programming interface. And, uh, you know, it's, like I said, a great API, but I'd actually like to go further than this. So this is not like a PL Rust uh, implementation. I'm trying to take it a little bit further than that, make it really kind of co-equal with C uh, in terms of capability. So, you know, the other thing, I, I'd like to see what Rust can do, right? I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's kind of an exciting language. Uh, there, but that also means there's a lot of marketing that goes overboard, right? I mean, it, you know, they kind of not intentionally from the Rust developers, but some of the community might get a little bit overexcited and, you know, maybe overstate some claims or overstate the ease with which those claims can be realized. Uh, and so, you know, let's let's really apply it to an interesting project, right? I mean, uh, Postgres is a a big piece of software with a lot of things going on, right? It's um, uh, I think I have another, oh yeah, this is the slide. So uh, it's got things like memory contexts, you know, doing the allocations. It's dealing with, you know, lots of global variables, set, ju set jump and long jump based error handling. You know, these are, you know, non-trivial things. In other words, we're not, you know, just kind of plugging it into our Hello World C app and saying, hey, Rust is great. We're plugging it into a real, you know, uh, thing like Postgres, and we're going to test uh, some of these ideas and, and how far they can really go and what we can really accomplish. Um, so, uh, what is Postgres extension.rs? This is a crate that I wrote. It's available. Uh, you can, you know, use it as a dependency uh, today. So, if you're writing your own Rust crate that's a, a library, I've got some examples, uh, you know, in, in GitHub as well. Uh, you can, those, you know, uh, extensions can use this as a dependency using uh, the crate uh, ecosystem, which is the package manager comparable to, you know, the package managers and other languages. Um, and, you know, so basically this dependency that you can pull in called Postgres extension, it's a collection of, you know, functions, macros, the kinds of things that you need. Uh, loosely speaking, it's, you know, like the C header files, right? So just like if you're developing a C extension, you need to have the Postgres server header files available to develop that. Um, also with uh, Rust, you would, you know, use this. And this is essentially providing definitions that you need to get stuff done. Now, you can imagine there's, you know, an awful lot of C header files in the server. Uh, so this only, you know, implements some of these things. I, I tried to really take on the hardest problems. Uh, and, you know, right now the, you know, the kind of boilerplate stuff of just kind of copying struct definitions around um, that, you know, it's, it's not kind of capturing all the C headers out there. Uh, but, uh, you know, I tried to take on some of the more challenging problems and, and see what kind of, you know, how far Rust could go with that. Uh, so I'll talk about those challenging problems and show some demos. Um, and just to clarify, uh, so Rust already has a great client driver. This is not like for developing, uh, you know, a, an application in Rust that talks to Postgres uh, with the client. This is really about uh, actually modifying the server with an extension. Um, so I just like to clarify that. Um, there's already a great Rust Postgres driver out there. Um, if you have an application 
you'd like it to talk to Postgres, you know, that's, that's uh, got a great answer. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the features of, you know, what I think I actually accomplished with, um, with Postgres extension.rs, the, the crate. So, you know, first of all, uh, you know, you can use these C structures uh, directly. So, you know, I mean, you might, um, you know, with using other languages, if you're using Python or something like that, uh, and you need to access, you know, some of the internal structures in, in Postgres, you might imagine that you would write some kind of translation layer that would uh, take the memory, copy it around, move it in different ways, and then eventually you have something that looks like Python that you can work with, and uh, then you operate on that. Uh, this, you know, I, I don't want to do that, right? I mean, it's for efficiency reasons and other reasons. You know, you just don't want to be kind of copying and translating all the time. So this can actually work directly on those C structures. If you get a parameter that's, uh, you know, a Postgres uh, um, structure, then you can just immediately use that as though you were writing C code, you know, mm -hmm. or comparably to writing C code. Uh, you're operating directly on that representation. You're not translating, you're not copying. Uh, so that's, that's a big uh, point to make um, because we don't want to discourage people from writing these extensions because they say, oh, well, we're copying it again and again. And, you know, how do we, um, you know, maybe it, they need to modify that structure and then that means they need to kind of translate it back uh, to update the changes. It might cost uh, in terms of efficiency. So I, I, uh, that's, that's an important point there. Uh, you know, another thing this uh, does is it actually uses PALIC and pfree for the memory allocation. So if you are using Rust standard library functions, a vector, strings, these kinds of things, uh, pushing and, you know, popping and all that stuff, uh, when that's doing allocations and freeze, uh, those are going through PALIC and pfree. So uh, that means it's happening in the memory context, just like in Postgres when you're doing these kinds of you know, p string dupe or some kind of string function or uh, something like that, then um, when Postgres is doing those internal allocations, it's using the, in the current memory context, and so will your Rust code. So it's a Postgres kind of feel to it. Um, so, and just like with C code, you know, if you're using memory context, you have to be careful when you're resetting them, deleting them, that kind of thing, because obviously, you know, that can leave, uh, you know, Rust with dangling re references if you kind of cut the memory out from under it. Okay. Um, and then this is, this is actually what I spent, you know, an awful lot of the time on is the error handling. And this is what has made it difficult for other uh, projects in the past, like or related to C++, to really be successful um, you know, in Postgres, right, is handling these, these error handling situations. So um, Postgres uses set jump and long jump. For those who don't know what those do, it's kind of about like what it sounds like. It jumps uh, across many stack frames. So if you have like deeply nested function calls, when Postgres encounters an error, uh, rather than kind of returning to each one, it uses this C standard library feature that just jumps over all these function calls back to a place where it can actually recover from the error. Kind of like an exception, but C doesn't have exceptions, they have set jump long jump, uh, which is a very kind of wild west way of, of doing this, um, but it's been very useful in Postgres for getting out of it, you know, a lot of work and kind of you know, aborting a transaction. It, it works quite well. So, uh, to handle this in Rust, um, it was a fair amount of effort to, one, actually make it work, and then to make it work somewhat ergonomically uh, with, um, you know, macros that can make these things, you know, nicer to program with. Uh, and then, yeah, so, uh, anyway, this, this ensures that, you know, Rust, the destructors are properly called, so, you know, it's not just kind of jumping over stack frames that, that Rust, you know, expects to be properly unwound. Okay, so uh, I'd like to, uh, just one second here, let me pull a terminal over there and then, uh, okay. Excuse 
Okay. Getting there. Better? OK. Um, so this is basically just kind of showing off the error handling. Uh, so uh, those who have written Postgres extensions and UDFs before uh, will recognize you know, PG module magic. That's kind of the Rust way of doing a macro with this uh, bang at the end. Um, I'm pulling in some uh, you know, C functions that I, I need access to. I'm pulling in some of the, the utilities in the uh, Postgres extension crate. Uh, so, you know, and then I'm doing something unsafe. I'm, you know, going to divide by zero. Uh, so, you know, that's something that might, you know, happen uh, in, in uh, you know, whatever Rust code you're writing. It might generate an error that way. So this div zero, basically it's going to, you know, come into this, um, uh, into this function here. Um, so... Uh, basically, we're going to see how like a, an internal error generated uh, can end up, you know, going back out and, and being properly handled. Um, the next one is a case of you're writing a function and you actually decide on your own you want to make your own e report. Uh, so that's what uh, this next function is about. Um, and the third is you uh, do something in Rust and then somewhere. Rust has, uh, I, I try not to make this too confusing because Postgres has a notion of panic and Rust has a notion of panic. So when you're reading this here, uh, this is uh, basically just um, using the Rust version of panic. So somewhere in your code, what that means is that it's going to kind of unwind the stack and then uh, get the error and then turn that into a Postgres error. Uh, so it's like these three different cases, uh, the first being that you call a Postgres function that throws an error. Uh, the second is that uh, you want to throw an error yourself. And the third is that, uh, you know, some Rust function you're calling wants to throw an error. Uh, and it's, I'm going to show how each of those are, are handled. Uh, so. So, uh, so you'll see this is uh, in the examples directory. So uh, this is actually a, a separate crate that depends on Postgres extension. So it's an example of using the Postgres extension to create these UDFs. Um, so we build it. Uh, we copy the generated. Uh, shared object files. So Rust is capable of generating shared object files, which are the way that Postgres uh, loads an extension. So we're going to copy that. And then we're going to, oops, window am I in here? Okay. And then we're going to uh, fire up Postgres. Um, Div zero, error, and panic. So if we select UDF panic. Okay, so what happened is the, the function, um, if we uh, just take a quick look back here. Uh, the function panic, this is a, a rust panic. So this is a case where you know, you have this uh, maybe deeply nested Rust code, throws a panic, and that's, again, not, not a Postgres panic. This causes a stack unwind and then is trans translated into a Postgres error. Uh, then the next one. Uh, 
here is a uh, time when you want to, within your Rust code, generate a nicely formatted e-report, and you'd like to provide, you know, detail and you know all kinds of things like that. Um, and it takes that e-report in Postgres, or in sorry, the e-report from Rust. It unwinds the stack and then translates it into a Postgres uh, error. And then the last one, div zero. Um, this is uh, generated inside of Postgres. You call this function. It ends up throwing divide by zero inside of the division function, and it passes that unmodified back up. It, it uh, catches it in Rust, unwinds the stack correctly, and then passes it unmodified back up into Postgres. Okay, so that's uh, demo number one. Do I have a question over here? Is there a reason you don't have a context saying that that happens in code, Rust code that you invoke from the WWF, and then in Postgres code, like an error context, or is that hard to do? Uh, an error context. Are you talking about like line numbers and stuff? No, or Oh, uh, so like the the file and are you talking about the no, you're not talking just about provide arbitrary context that just throws oh. um, yeah I think uh, I think I just didn't do that um, but uh, you know basically you know yeah I don't think there's any reason it can't be done. Uh, what are the explanation marks in the source code? Oh, uh, so in Rust they have a hard distinction between function calls and macros. So every uh, macro ends in exclamation point, and function calls do not. Yeah, so it's just, you know, that part of the language. Okay, and then, okay. Uh, so the next um, demo I have is a little bit more interesting. Um, so let's uh, first look at it. So this is uh, UDF SPI, and it <coughs> does some SPI stuff. Uh, so you know those familiar with kind of higher level languages might be happy to see that it's a little bit easier than using SPI might be in, in ordinary uh, C code. Um, so I've got you know I've got this connection being made. I, I execute that on the connection object, and I have some iterators there that you know, can iterate through the result set tuples, uh, and then also uh, through the attributes in, the tuple, in each tuple. So we got this kind of nested for loops, but it's you know, only you know, fewer lines of code than it would be in C. Uh, so one thing I'd like to point out here is that you know, I'm, I'm doing some things differently. The SPI uh, API in in Postgres is quite a bit uglier. You know, if who's, uh, who here has used the C API for SPI? Okay, so uh, there's a couple things you might recall. One of them is that SPI Connect doesn't return anything, so you might be wondering what that thing is. Uh, the other thing is uh, SPI uh, does kind of return things from an, you know query execution, but they end up in these global variables which you have to kind of copy over and you have to be sure not to execute another SPI function because it'll overwrite those global variables without freeing whatever resources they were pointing to. So you better get the reference to the tuple table while you can. Uh, and it's, you know, potentially leads to, um, you know, uh, it's, it's error prone, let's say. Um, and there have been bugs in Postgres, not even in Postgres extensions, but there have actually been bugs in core Postgres uh, because of that API. And there is a comment pointing out that it is perhaps not the best API, um, and, but we're stuck with it. But in Rust here, so uh, I you know, kind of solved some of these problems, I believe. I think I made a, a nicer, uh, less error-prone API. Um, so one of the things I'm doing here is I'm re returning this object, this SPI object here, if I'll put the cursor on that variable. And then uh, that is a zero-sized value. So there's no allocation there. It's really just compile time thing. Um, and the reason I do this is because, for one thing, that way you can't really call the execute method 
without having connected first. So that's a potential, you know, those of who have used SPI have probably all made that mistake. Um, and so it's, you know, just nicely there. It also allows, um, you know, the destructor to call SPI finish. And so it kind of helps you make this, uh, this symmetric, you know, use the API in this symmetric way consistently. Um, and so it, it, it kind of offers these benefits, uh, you know, but it's actually a zero size type. So that's not doing any allocation there, not even on the stack. Um, the uh, result set here, this uh, is uh, not zero size, but it's the same size as if you were to kind of copy those global variables locally, which you really should anyway. So, um, you know, just it's, uh, I think, you know, two or three words or whatever to uh, make a copy of those global variables before you lose them from the next call. A question over here? Um, and so uh, that, I also consider zero cost, you know, compared to using the API the way you should, uh, because you really should make copies of those global variables unless, you know, I mean, it's just kind of asking for trouble. It's not really expensive, a couple stack variables, you know, maybe in registers, so I, I don't really consider that to be a cost. You could get around it if you really wanted to, by the way, it's not like Rust can't support global variables, you know, but uh, you'd almost never want to do that. Um, the iterators, they might have some, you know, kind of transient uh, data costs, you know, maybe on the stack or in registers or something, but it's pretty lightweight. It's basically, you know, just all using the same data and references where appropriate. It's not doing a bunch of data copying. It's not doing real allocations. So that's also, you know, zero cost. So you're basically getting, you know, for paying nothing, you're getting this, you know, substantially better API uh, that prevents a lot of mistakes, including, um, you know, making sure to finish the, uh, you know, SPI finish at the end. Um, so uh, maybe I'll actually run this example. If somebody has a question, please uh, jump in. Uh, the destructor for this zero size SPI object will SPI finish, which is the disconnect, right? So the, that's the uh, other side of the connect. Okay, so let's build it. So I'll go build, and then um, copy, copy the right one, CDF SPI. Okay, and now let's go back to our server. Because of the way Postgres works, we just need to make a new connection and we'll get the new code. Create or replace. So first, I'll just select star from foo, and we see we have this wonderful table here, uh, very sophisticated. Uh, and then if we also do UDF SPI, which is running the same query, uh, we get these notices printed out. Um, that'll kind of make sense when we look back at the code. You'll see how these notices are generated. It's just returning a one always, and it kind of builds up those, those strings for each tuple uh, it gets out of SPI. So I'll look, we can look back at the code here. Uh, and you'll see here, this is where it's you know, doing the notices, uh, building up the strings. It's kind of pushing, you know, uh, push is kind of a way to build up strings. These are formatting codes here. These, uh, the simplest one is just curly brace and curly brace, but there might be formatting options inside of those. Uh, so it's like a, it's a formatting string. And then here it's doing the return, which we saw at the end. So that's, that's an SPI example. I think the interesting part there uh, that is different is just that I feel like the API is safer and nicer without imposing a significant cost. Dave, David? I believe that is immutable. Um, Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't, what would it mean to, mo to mutate a tuple that you get back from SPI? I mean, it, 
it wouldn't go back to the table, right? And, oh, sorry, that's, I missed the, the shortcut below the resulting range. I assume that you're changing the, the where, I mean, so this is just kind of a read-only thing. Is there a reason, you know? So, are you? Do you just mean that that's um, like kind of rebound each time through the loop? Yeah. Okay. So that in um, Rust isn't really considered mutating it because it's a separate binding each time. It's it's almost as if you had had like the dec the declared value in this block. So it's just uh, it's not actually mutating the value, but it's. Uh, yes, it would be. Um, so I, I think in this case it's uh, kind of a reference or immutable. It's the the actual memory of the tuple is is uh, it's just a reference to that. So um, I mean, there's not much destruction to do. Uh, SPI will clean up the result set um, afterward. The result set does have a destructor which frees the result set. Uh, and then if you SPI finish, it frees all the result sets generated in that session. Andres? Can you cast error to throw in an SPI and then punch it in some way? And if so, what exactly? Because we need to do weird stuff to actually um, yeah. SPI contacts and stuff. Uh, so, I mean, you have the same problems there you do in C, right? I mean, kind of doing a try catch around SPI is a little bit questionable, you know, more than a little bit questionable in C as well. Uh, so I, I didn't magically solve that just by using Rust, but uh, I mean, yeah, I yeah. Uh, so I mean that, I mean in, in general you've got to be really careful with the try catch around SPI because it might have changed tuples, in, you know, and actually there's MVCC information there, so if then you kind of catch that and end up an error and then end up committing the transaction, then it's possible you would have like, uh, you know, things that you inserted that wrong. Um, yeah, so I'm trying not to do that level of, of magic here because, you know, it would be something that the developer would really want control over. It's, I want this to be kind of a, at the same level of abstraction as C um, with perhaps some safer interfaces, but I'm, I'm trying not to do kind of things behind the scenes like save points. Uh, you know, a C programmer would have to do their own save points, and then so would a Rust programmer. Well, well there are um, languages that have, like, customizer wrapper, like, you know, Perl and stuff have, like, pretty nice yeah. wrapper Yeah, uh, I mean, I think there would be, you know, room to do that as, like, an optional extra layer, but just that, you know, my primary goal for this project is not to be at a higher level um, unless it's kind of a no-brainer, sort of like these SPI iterators and stuff would just make things easier without really changing the level of control you have. Um, so yeah, basically the, the scope of this is not to make it feel like, you know, programming in Python or something like that or with kind of magic happening behind the scenes. I just want it to be like, you know, at that same low level that a C programmer would expect. Yeah, so the unwrap, uh, this is a Rust thing. It's basically if you have something that can return a result or an option or something like that where, you know, maybe it returns a result, maybe it returns nothing, or maybe it returns an error, these, these options. So you can handle uh, these, whoa, uh -oh. I hope this uh, video comes Okay, so um, the unwrap is basically a way to kind of short circuit that and say, I, I know there's a value there, just give it to me. And then if there isn't a value there, then panic. So if that panic were to happen, we would end up get seeing that as a Postgres error. Um, be a Rust panic happened. So I, during this whole talk, anytime I say panic, it's not the Postgres panic, it's a Rust panic. <laughs> um, so uh, that's what would happen in that case. So it would be handled reasonably well. Here, I'm really expecting a result. I could have kind of handled this and wrote in more Rust code to make it more robust. Uh, but I just, 
I just didn't do that for clarity. Um, and that's a pretty common pattern. If you know something's there, then uh, you just unwrap. And then you know, if you, you're wrong later, you're going to get a panic and know where it's from. Um, and then uh, I'm running out of time a little bit here. But I have one more demo that I'd like to show off. It'll be a little bit quick. OK, so this is, uh, let me actually, let me build it first and kind of show it off first. And then we can look at the code. Okay, This is a background worker. So here, I already set up the configuration file to auto load this, this uh, background worker. And so it listens on 8080. And then if we use netcat, it's just reading lines off the network and executing them as SPI and returning the result. <laughs> so uh, when I, <laughs> so uh, lots of things. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Uh, so if we just do like select one, boom, we get a one. Uh, select. So like star from foo, we get our table back. And then uh, this is uh, a this is a concurrent system. So and I'll show you that in a second. OK, so you'll notice I had two connections going there. They're both working. OK, so uh, how is that you know, working? Is it two background workers? No, it's, it's one background worker. And it's using a, a kind of a cool uh, Rust library that's gotten a lot of attention um, called Tokyo, which uh, is a futures runtime. So this is uh, futures are a concept in program in programming, it's a form of abstraction for, like, say, asynchronous operations where you are essentially deferring the work. Uh, you, you kind of say, do this you know, uh, later, and then when you have the result available, then you know, I'll, I'll be able to get that result later. Uh, and then if you, you know, build these things up enough, you have whole network libraries and uh, things like that that allow you to process many concurrent network requests in uh, either a thread pool, kind of arbitrarily shuffling among them, or in this case here, just a single current thread runtime which runs it all in the current process. Um, so basically, you know, I've got a process request which looks a lot like our previous um, UDF SPI. Uh, and then, but I've also got this set up here to initialize the background worker. Um, and then have a main function that does all the, you know, unblock signals and all that other stuff you need to do. And then here is me creating a runtime. Got a server that, uh, which is a, this kind of way of building up futures. So at the beginning when I said all the code would be intelligible, except the last thing, this is what I was talking about. <laughs> it's not intelligible to me either. So if somebody knows uh, more about this, then, then they, they might be happy. I, I do know a little bit about this, but it's uh, kind of a different style. It's, a, it's like asynchronous programming. It's supposed to be a higher level than that, uh, than kind of the raw state machines. Um, you can program with futures. And you basically uh, have this way of getting uh, lines over the network. And then when one thing is doing something, you can do it. Uh, when uh, the next, you know, um, when that is kind of waiting on input, say waiting on new data to come over the network, then it just gets you know kind of yields, and the next uh, request you know in turn comes along, and you know you process what you have. Uh, so this allows the concurrency. Um, it also executes everything in one background worker, which is good because uh, you know executing SPI across a bunch of threads or something would be would be a very uh, dubious thing to do. So. Um, anyway, the, the kind of point of this example is really to show, you know, a non-trivial combination of all these things coming together, you know, using uh, something that's not just a UDF, but actually a, a background worker that does, you know, interesting things uh, in Postgres and, you know, needing to copy things out of memory contexts and, 
and this kind of thing using, and then in addition, so it's doing non-trivial Postgres stuff. It's also doing non-trivial Rust stuff. This is a large dependency doing a lot of stuff, and it all kind of comes together and works. Um, so uh, if I might just, you know, kind of conclude uh, from here, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of room for, uh, you know, developing extensions in Rust. And, you know, I think it, uh, it essentially stood up to, you know, every challenge that, that I, I put forward. And I, I think that I solved a lot of the hard problems in this, um, in this process for actually writing, uh, for actually writing real extensions in Rust and doing real stuff. I think that Rust kind of came through and, and uh, withstood the challenges and kind of, in my opinion, it, it seems like it's a real low-level database-worthy language. So uh, I'll take any questions. Yes? Can you run a size or an LED on your Uh Yes, I can. It's um, probably going to be large. It's debug and everything else. You can, uh, with Rust, cut out a lot of stuff, including the standard library. It's meant to be used even in embedded environments. I can't really speak much to that. Um, but uh, let's see here. Uh, to that part of it, but supposedly, you know, uh, it looks like 14 megabytes. Um, oh. Okay. So here we have one point. Uh, looks like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's yeah mostly just code. Uh, so. Um, but uh, yeah, um, should be it, it should be possible to cut it down as as much in size as possible. Like similar to C, you know, you could cut out the standard library or cut out this library. Uh, it tries to inline things and and cut out symbols it doesn't need and that kind of stuff. Uh, if we did a release build, um, you know, I think it would go through a link time optimization pass as well and all that and so. Should be reasonable. Question? Do you have work to do, or how, how um, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it really, I just did a few. Um, I, I took on what I felt like were the hard problems. You know, after you know, after that, I think I need to write some more utilities that just do things that maybe everyone would need to do, but or you know, maybe lots of people would need to use, uh, but that um, maybe not that terribly hard. And then the other things that might be functions I wouldn't guess necessarily would need to be called. Uh, you might just need to write some extern declarations, you know, at the top to pull those in. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it's, I think it's a good start. And like I said, I'm just trying to solve the hardest problems so that we have a place to take it from here uh, incrementally. Um, so, you know, I, I think it would be a good thing to, to hack on. Um, so. Anyway, yeah, I'd be, um, I think, I see people kind of lining up here, so I'm, uh, I'll, I'll take uh, certainly more questions uh, in the hallway or, you know, at the party later, anytime, happy to. Uh, so again, uh, you know, my name's uh, Jeff Davis, if you want to find me. I work for Citus Data Microsoft, um, and that's all. Thank you very much, everyone.